welcome back to Words of Paradise. I'm your host, Leon Idol. And as I spend my time going back through Star Wars Shadows of the Empire, my favorite Star Wars game of all time, polygons and all, I started to think about that. Polygons. And it made me realize, I should check up on Polygon, see what they have to say. And in a fortuitous manner, I found an article about Willow, another Lucasfilm product from the way back, and I thought, wow, I'm playing a Star Wars game with polygons? There's an article about Willow, made by the guy that made Star Wars? Let's take a look at this. And here we go, in all of polygons' glory, Willow has become what all queer fantasy love stories should feel like. The fifth episode recasts how queerness can fit with fantasy tropes. Mm, buddy, let's get into this one. You got me excited to see what sort of tripe and nonsense you have for us today. Willow's kit, Tantalos, does not look or act like your typical princess. Actor Ruby Cruz imbues Kit with a brash, roguish charm that would put Mad Mardigan himself to shame. Does not act like your typical princess. So warrior princesses aren't typical. I guess someone should tell that to Princess Leia, a warrior princess from the 70s. Xena, warrior princess, a warrior princess literally in the title from the 90s. Which, fun fact, I've met Lucy Lawless when I was about... 15 or 16 at a convention, she was a childhood crush, and oh my goodness, she is still gorgeous. <laughs> or Merida, you know, another Disney princess that is in fact a warrior princess from Brave. Heck, at this point, Disney has several warrior princess characters. So to act like this is new, out the gate, this article is a sham. Kit is stubborn, and often petulant to a fault. Prefers leather armor to ball gowns, is quick with her sword, and, as pointed out in episode 4, has it bad for her best friend and self-appointed protector, Jade Claymore. I, um, I have been for some time. Just totally, ridiculously, desperately in love with you. And in about 10 seconds, I'm going to kiss you. So if you don't want that, yes, I, I... As it happens, level-headed and loyal Jade is also head over heels for Kit. For years now, fans have been clamoring for a queer Disney princess. Have they, though? Have they really? I mean, clamoring is a strong choice of word, but alright, I'll bite. And in some way, Willow has delivered. Jade and Kit's story has all the beats of traditional fantasy romance, but with a modern sensibility to it. <laughs> okay, well, I don't want modern sensibility in my fantasy. The whole idea of fantasy is that it's escapism, and if you need to see queer romances in your fantasy for you to be fulfilled by it, you're kind of missing the point. Go play D&D or any other RPG where you can, you know, bed who you want to bed, and don't shove this sort of political propaganda in TV shows that, let's be honest, don't need them. It doesn't add anything. Except for maybe some warm, fuzzy feelings you get when you pat yourself on the back saying you're a fan of it because you're proud of the diversity. Making it feel fresh and new in a genre that often teases queerness but steers away from it in the end. The result here is an organic and utterly charming plotline that doesn't feel like it was devised just to include token representation. Oh my goodness, yes it does! The series showrunner Jonathan Kasdan literally says, Sequel series central lesbian romance. So when you try and tell me, doesn't feel like it was devised just to include token representation. That's literally what it was devised to do because he says it's a central plot. It wouldn't be central if that wasn't what it was devised for. You say devised like it's got some sort of negative connotation. But no, when you devise something, it means you put it in and come up with it and create it. This was devised, this was created for that representation and that inherently makes it tokenized. The Lady and the Knight is a chivalric, if somewhat overwrought, trope that most fantasy films will be familiar with. The Lady is portrayed as beautiful and dignified, if somewhat helpless, young women who need saving. The Knight is the strong and handsome man who has sworn to protect her. As their relationship grows, they often become romantically entangled. Willow takes this trope and gleefully flips the entire thing on its head. Okay, no, it doesn't take this trope and flip it on its head because we've seen strong princesses before. And we've seen female knights and female warriors before. Instead of a young man, a young woman is determined to become a knight in shining armor, and the beautiful lady in question isn't afraid to get her hands dirty and is perfectly capable of taking care of herself. 
It's been an absolute delight to watch both Kit and Jade embody the roles of the Lady and the Knight, respectively, as they navigate their feelings for one another while trying to save Kit's brother and, on a much larger scale, the world. While the characters themselves have reportedly tried to deny their romantic feelings for one another, the romantic tension between them has only grown since their sword fight and stolen kiss in Episode 1. Being heroes hasn't afforded them much time to process those feelings, but the tension between them has been undeniable in the private moments that they've shared together. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to defer back to the clip that I shared with you guys. Those private moments where they're seen together reads like a CW script. Rather than shy away from queerness, or make a spectacle of it, it absolutely does make a spectacle of it, but go on. Willow joyously celebrates in a way that's still missing from so many fantasy and sci-fi shows. It is not still missing. If the author wants to put it in there, awesome. If they don't, awesome. You don't need it. It is not necessary. So if something is not necessary, it wouldn't be missing. If I was making sugar cookies, and then I gave those cookies to somebody, and they tell me, the chocolate chips are missing. Uh, no, I, I wasn't making chocolate chip cookies. Now, if I was going to make chocolate chip cookies, and I didn't put chocolate chips in, then they would be missing. So, you're not using this terminology properly, because it's not missing from these shows if it was never intended to be there in the first place. That's what people don't seem to care about or understand when writing articles like this. It's perfectly fine to have shows that have no queer romance, or no romance at all, or only straight romance, as long as the artist and the creator writes what they want to write and they're not being hampered by people telling them put this in, put that in, regardless of what this and that are. For me, this harkens back to Dragon Ball Z. The mangaka, Akira Toriyama, you know, the writer, artist, uh, he was told by his editors multiple times to change things and do different things, and he hated editors. He fired like three of them, if I remember right, and I'm A-OK -okay with that. If you're an artist and you have a vision, then you should get to put forth your vision in whatever way you see fit. If it's good, it will succeed. If it's not, it won't. But putting in all these mandates and, oh, you need to do this, and you need to show this sort of representation, and you need to make sure that you include this sort of queer character, no, that takes away from the integrity of what the artist wants to create. If the artist wants to do that of their own volition, then that is fine. But then it also shouldn't be celebrated as something monumental. You should just move on because if you want to normalize it, you can't normalize something by celebrating every time it's done. You should just treat it as normal and continue and maybe talk about the direction or the choreography or the acting, the writing, things that you can more or less be objective about. Often queerness becomes a complication with the story. A character might feel like they have to hide who they are or come out to their companions before their adventure can progress, but that's not the case here. And Willow isn't just a show about swashbuckling adventurers. It's a show about love and how to take care of one another. Over the course of the series, Willow and his companions have become a found family. They might not be related by blood, but they've come together to form a unit based on their shared experiences and understanding of one another, despite occasionally butting heads. Okay, so it's literally like any other adventure story. Give me an adventure story with an ensemble cast where this doesn't happen. Lord of the Rings. The Fellowship don't always get along in butt heads. Star Wars. All three leads, Han, Luke, and Leia, they don't exactly see eye to eye on how to handle certain things. You could even say Terminator 2 for spot number three on my hypothetical list. John Connor, Sarah Connor, and the T-800 don't exactly always agree about the best methods to handle what they're up against. This is literally normal for stories that include an ensemble cast going on an adventure, whether it be sci-fi, fantasy, you name it. It's yet another trope Willow weds the couple's story to, but it's used with purpose. Their love isn't simple or pat, it's integral to, and integrated with, the whole world around them. Many fantasy fans are also familiar with the concept of a dark, mysterious stretch of forest with the power to show those who enter it what they desire the most. Yeah, Harry Potter did it with the Mirror of Error said. I mean, it wasn't a forest, but you get my point. It's something that's been done. The Wildwood is seductive, Foreman says. It lures you in with its sights and sounds. Next thing you know, you're officiating weddings and dog-sitting for casual acquaintances. He's not entirely wrong, either. Throughout the course of the episode, Elora, Graydon, and Borman are all faced with something they want. But it's Kit and Jade who truly take center stage. Yeah, okay. They're the main characters. They probably should take center stage. But also, doesn't that kind of uh, harken back to what you were saying about how it's not tokenized? If the lesbian romance is what takes center stage... I don't know, to me that comes off like pandering tokenization. Because if it wasn't pandering tokenization, 
there wouldn't be a center stage. They would all be given sort of equal credit in their wants and desires. Almost immediately after entering the Wildwood, Willow and company are captured by bloodthirsty bone reavers and separated from one another. Kit, much to her dismay, is locked up with Alora, leaving her to worry about Jade's safety. Alora, clearly as fed up with their mutual pinning as Borman is, proceeds to tell Kit, I believe that love is the most powerful force in the universe. Alright, I mean, once again, this is just a CWS line, but sure, include it and make it seem like your article has some sort of deep intrinsic meaning. Elora is, of course, talking about her relationship with Eric, but the sentiment applies to Kit and Jade, too. What ensues is a brilliant, if somewhat brief, moment between the two characters who have otherwise spent most of the season at each other's throats. It's also incredibly refreshing to watch. Kit's feelings for Jade aren't trivialized, used against her, or turned into a shocking reveal. Instead, it's made clear that Alora and everyone else in their band of adventurers are truly rooting for Kit and Jade. Well, yeah, they're written that way because if there was anyone that wasn't rooting for Kit and Jade, then all of a sudden this show would be lambasted for being anti-gay. Homophobic! Eventually, with the help of some truth plums, Kit and Jade are able to confess their feelings for one another in the depths of the Wildwood. It's aided with the help of another well-worn fantasy trope, but it's a heartfelt confession of love that's been slowly building over five episodes, and presumably for much longer than that. For the first time since the beginning of the show, they're able to put aside their respective titles and just be two young women who are hopelessly in love with one another. And at this point, all the viewers are five hours in and hopeless about time they can never get back. Of course, things don't go entirely to plan. There are more episodes in the season, after all. Before they can kiss, Jade and Kit are interrupted by a band of trolls. Kit is consequently pulled from Jade's grasp and abruptly whisked away, leaving Jade to be the knight she's always wanted to be. While Willow successfully puts a new spin on the lady and the knight trope, already doesn't, I've given reasons why, but whatever. It also cleverly acknowledges that Jade and Kit still have parts to play in it. Alright, so that's the end of that article. Look, I know I probably come off as super anti-LGBT and homophobic, and that's not the case at all. I truly don't mind or don't care about what people do with their lives as long as they're consenting adults. I'm very pro and supportive of gay marriage, equal rights for all, the whole nine, but I'm so annoyed at articles like this because if you want to normalize something, clapping and shrieking every time that you get what you're asking for that's not normal, so it doesn't normalize it. Instead, it comes off as annoying. I'm sorry to keep using food as examples, but maybe I'm hungry. So let's say that me and my family spend all of our time eating out. Uh, but we decide we want to be healthier, so we want to normalize cooking at home and eating healthier. If my family clapped and hooted and hollered every time we made dinner instead of going out, then it wouldn't seem normal, because that's not normal. It is not normal to throw some sort of happy, cheery celebration for cooking your own food at home. No. We would just cook at home, eat the food, be like, that was good, let's see what's on TV, and then turn on something other than Willow. Well, that's all I've got for this one. Please like, comment, subscribe. I really do hope you subscribe, because I'm trying to grow this channel, and it would mean the world to me. And follow me on Twitter at BoltTheWord, because this has been... Words of Paradise.